and also I have uh, my very great pleasure is to introduce the Aron Gupta to, to this stage. So please, can you come join me? Uh, I would also like to say that um, Aron had a difficulty uh, in the last couple of days. He has a problem with his knee and uh, until uh, the last day we didn't know if he will come. So very much, I'm very much thankful for that. And I think that uh, most of the audience really is very thankful for you that you're able to come. Thank you. I'm excited to be here as well. Good morning. Well, let's try again. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm a runner, so you know, my knee being busted is a really bad thing for me. But hopefully it'll be all right in the next few weeks. I've been working out, so um, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, well, OK, my slides are up there. Um, cool. All right, so um, I thought we were talking about what is the topic that would be relevant for the attendees. So um, recently, I've been talking to a lot of our customers uh, in terms of chaos engineering. So I thought I'll give the fundamentals of what chaos engineering is about and how particularly you can apply those principles uh, in context of Kubernetes. How many of you have been playing with Kubernetes in some shape and form? OK, some of you. So, well, how many of you have been playing with some sort of containers, Docker containers? That's the most of you. All right, cool. So um, I would love to see more interaction. Um, let's, let me kind of go through the slides here. And uh, I'm happy to hang out outside and talk to you more about your needs. Um, my name is Arun Gupta. I'm a principal open source technologist. I'm part of the open source team at Amazon. Uh, I'm also the board representative for Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So I talk to a lot of our customers around open source technologies, around how do we take them into production with containers, and topics like these, you know, chaos engineering, which sort of our customers are looking into. So let me kind of give you some history and background here. Warner Vogels, you know, who's the CTO of Amazon, he wrote an article about 10 years ago, uh, well, basically on the history of 10 years of AWS. And the quote itself is quite prominent. It says, failures are a given, and everything eventually will fail over time. No matter what, you're using a low-cost hardware or a high-cost hardware, whether it's your network router, whether it's your disk, whether it's your in-memory, whether it's corrupting TCP packets, whatever it is, you know, I mean, it's not in your control. It will eventually fail. And this failure particularly becomes very critical now, if you think about S3, which is doing trillions and trillions of transactions on a regular basis, anything that could possibly fail will eventually fail. And so the goal is that you cannot avoid that. That's, that's a very important aspect that you need to understand about it. So now our goal is to keep the ship running, even if there is a failure. So the key attitude that you want to adapt over there is embrace the failure as opposed to just you know, close your eyes and say the CAD is not coming, because the CAD is coming no matter what you do. Okay? Let me talk about some of the history of how this has been done. You know, um, what's all the history around chaos engineering? Back in 2006, uh, Jesse Robbins, I'm sorry, I'm going to grab a seat, actually. It's too, too hard for me to stand for too long. Um, so back in 2006, Jesse Robbins, you know, he, started, he started the concept of game day. And Game day is basically an exercise where he would run to make sure that Amazon.com, the website Amazon.com, would stay afloat in case there are issues with the underlying services. So he would randomly shut down the power of a data center. He would randomly kill a database server where the things are being served. So I would really recommend taking a look at this particular video where you know, he talks about what the game day is, and there's a YouTube video, and the slides would definitely be available for you guys. Think about sudden spikes in your customer traffic. That's a very normal part of your doing business. You, know, you really hope that there is a customer spike for the right reasons, and you can sell more. So uh, Jesse Robbins was the founding CEO of Chef. He left Amazon to found Chef. So kind of, kind of give you a little bit more background over there. How many of you have heard of Chaos Monkeys? Now, that's a popular concept. You know, so Netflix brought, brought that concept to more mainstream, essentially. And there it talked about a system is running. You know, the chaos monkey wakes up during a live running system and randomly starts killing different processes. Because chaos monkey is doing it by design, but what if that could happen accidentally for you? 
if that happens accidentally for you, you still want to make sure that your system is live. Netflix is in the business of streaming video to its customers. So even if there is a service down, if they're not able to stream video, that's a customer impact. And that's the key aspect that they're looking at it. So, and these things happen all the time. And if you learn about Netflix, if you read their case study, Netflix started on Amazon and they run on Amazon from day one. That's continued to be their, um, uh, they're all in customer for AWS essentially. And at a given day, the number of calls that come into Netflix from the outside world and the number of calls that span across AWS, those are in order of high millions and billions. You know, and that's in a day. And because of the nature of these network calls, something will fail. So how do you gracefully degrade your service experience? And how do you make sure that the customers at the end of the day can continue to watch that movie or that TV show that they care about? From that team that used to be called as the Chaos Engineering team at Netflix, uh, they wrote a book called as Chaos Engineering. It's a free download on O'Reilly. Um, it's a very short read, about 70, 80 pages, you know, short book. Um, very fun reading book, so I would re really recommend uh, because it talks about exactly how, wh what did they do? You know, what was their experience building that chaos engineering experiments? And how did they, wh what are the different aspects uh, within the Netflix uh, architecture that they incorporated for um, chaos engineering? Let's switch gears. <clears throat> we are talking about wh what is the purpose of doing chaos engineering? Let let's try to understand that. The way we look at it is you're doing chaos engineering to make sure that your applications are resilient. And what is resilience? Well, I mean, the resilience is the ability of a system to adapt to changes, failures, and disturbances. Let's go back to running for a second. I'm a runner, so my analogies are for that. I'm a runner, and I mean, I've been running for many, many years. I've run several marathons around the world. This knee problem is just a temporary problem. You know, how do I react to this failure so that I can go back to running? You know, the show must go on. I think that's the key part that we look at it. In our life, you know, we fall sick, but the, the, moment, the reason we fall sick is, could be whatever, but once we fall sick, we all work towards getting better and then moving on with our life. So in that sense, if you look at human body, it is the most resilient thing that we have ever seen. Now, let's apply that to chaos engineering. <clears throat> you go to the website called as principlesofchaos.org, and that website actually gives you a formal definition of what really chaos engineering is. Now, if I were to read this definition for you, chaos engineering is a discipline of experimenting on a distributed system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production. So, first of all, you want to understand that this main exercise of doing chaos engineering is to build confidence in your system. You know, you're not trying to break things or introduce a chaos monkey for the heck of it. You are trying to break things because that's what could happen in a real distributed system. And so you're doing it by design so that if it happens you know, on real, you have a better confidence and you have taken care of that. And we'll talk about how do we go through that entire process. The other important part to also learn here is um, the turbulent conditions can happen in production. Let's say your website is running you know, on uh, Amazon and then all of a sudden come Thanksgiving or come Christmas, the customer traffic goes up. Or you, know, you have a wide variety of services that you're talking to and one of the services happen to go down. Or something happens in your application. How do you deal with that? Because end of the day, if you are not able to serve your customer, that is that much lost business opportunity for you. So that's why the whole concept of chaos engineering is relevant. You want to make sure that you practice that in real. <clears throat> Another important part that you want to think and realize around chaos engineering is that no matter what you do, there are bad things that will happen to your system. You know, if you are you know, getting a few hundred users here and there, um, and then if there is something bad that happens to your system, it won't have that much impact. But remember, I was talking about S3, where we're doing trillions and trillions of operations. Any single thing tends to go big. So you cannot become ignorant to the fact that things can go, go wrong. 
So one of the things that we have come up with, the concept of a blast radius. And what that idea is that if you are making, you know, if, if a service goes down, you want to make sure it's blast radius. That means the area of application that will get impacted is going to be super low. You want to make sure that if DynamoDB table is for some reason not scaling, you know, it doesn't impact it. There is a cache layer, for example, in front of it sitting that will hopefully you know, let you still give a response back to your customers. So what do we do and how do we apply this thing you know, into um, your real life? Well, the idea is you break your system on purpose, as I've been saying. So you find out what are the weaknesses as part of breaking this system. And once you have found out what the weaknesses are, then you actually try to fix them before um, when they are least expected. Now, who wants to get a call at 2 in the morning that your application is broken and come fix it? You like getting 2 a.m. call? I, I, I like my sleep. So I'm like 9 to 6. I finish my job. I'm going back home. I want to have a fun time with my kids. I want to watch a movie or, you know, relax something. So the whole idea is to make sure that you can continue watching Netflix as much as you want. So practice chaos engineering. This could be scary. Like, what do you mean? You are telling me that I'm going to break my systems? And it could be scary depending upon who you are talking to, as a matter of fact. Um, if, you're, if you walk into a customer site and you say that, hey, you know what? I'm going to do chaos engineering in your applications. Guess what the customer is going to say? So, well, stop. Stop outside the door. Don't talk to me ever. I don't want any chaos in my system. It's working. Not broken. Don't fix it. That's an important part. So then you get out of the door. You go back in again. Then you tell him that, oh, I'm going to make your applications more resilient. I get that. That's the value I want to see. Because what you are talking to the customer is the process, not the end result. So that's an important differentiation. Chaos engineering is only a process to make your applications more resilient. It also depends, you know, who you are selling the concept of chaos engineering to. If you're selling the concept of chaos engineering to your manager, you don't tell them about chaos engineering. You say, I'm just making my applications resilient. And if you're selling that concept to engineers to get them excited, you say, yeah, resilience is just an effect of chaos engineering. Let's do chaos engineering. So it really depends, you know, manager, customer, you know, engineer, who are you talking to? So it could be scary. But this is a quote that I love from Nora Jones. Nora Jones is from the chaos engineering. By the way, now that team within Netflix itself is called as a reliability engineering team because chaos does have that negative connotation that, what do you mean, you're trying to break my applications here? So uh, Nora Jones made this quote, beautiful quote, which says, chaos engineering only reveals problems. It doesn't cause problems because those problems are only hidden. Go back to running again for a second. Somebody gave me the, somebody told me the quote, and I just love it. It says, we all have problems in our bodies. You know, if you're running too much, like I'm a marathon runner, I've been, I run like 40, 50 miles a week sometimes. If you're running that much regularly, it only helps you reveal the problems earlier in your life. I mean, we all have those issues. That's the way I look at it. And so really, um, in terms of chaos engineering, it says chaos only reveals problems. And your goal is by doing this exercise to reveal them and then fix them so that they don't happen in production, particularly when your customer traffic is at its peak. So how do we start? How do we kind of get going with this? Well, I mean, you could start uh, with failure injection in your application by design. And I'm not really talking about functional failures or unit test failures or integration failures. No, those are usual. I mean, your application is basically functional, but you are looking at it, what if my application starts throwing HTTP 500 error? What if my services are not able to scale to meet the customer demand? What if there is a denial of service and all of a sudden my application was designed for 100 concurrent users and I got 10,000 concurrent users? The, what if my Kubernetes cluster was running and I only had four worker nodes, and then all of a sudden, I'm getting a lot of concurrent requests. What if there are network attacks, region attacks? It's a paranoia. It is a paranoia, but that's what you need to be aware of in order to make your applications resilient. So what do you do? You know, where do you inject chaos? 
think of your application stack essentially. You know, there is an application layer, there's a caching layer, there's a database layer. You could be running on-prem, you could be running in the cloud. You know, there are multiple places you know, that, are, that basically compose your application stack. So the idea here is that you could pretty much inject chaos at all possible layers of your application. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the phases of chaos engineering. And again, these phases of chaos engineering are defined on um, principlesofchaos.com. And they provide sort of a very good definition of what these phases are essentially. So let's kind of walk through them one by one. So the first thing that we were looking at is sort of a steady state. Okay? Now, to specifically address the uncertainty of distributed systems at scale, uh, chaos engineering can be thought of as a facilitation of experiments um, to uncover systemic weaknesses. That's essentially a whole your, of your whole idea of chaos engineering is that you want to identify that. So what you do is you start by defining a steady state in your application. Now, what is steady state? Well, steady state is uh, some measurable output of your system that indicates normal behavior. That could be, um, I expect my website to load up in less than a second. That could be, uh, I expect a search on my website to return results in certain milliseconds. So that's sort of what your steady state is. Um, let's dig a little bit deeper into steady state now. So in terms of steady state, essentially what you're looking at it is, it's your normal behavior of your system. Um, you know exactly that, you know, come, go back in case of Netflix, that um, come evening hours, the traffic spikes up, come 11 a.m. Uh, Tuesday morning, hopefully the traffic is not that high and people are at work. And even at work, they are hopefully not watching Netflix that much. They're hopefully working and doing a meeting or a staff meeting or some boring meeting, whatever. So the point is that those are your predictable patterns that you know on what it needs to look like. Um, so um, the stronger the relationship between the metric and the business outcome you care about, uh, the stronger the signal you have for making actionable decisions. You want to make sure that my patterns are clear. So in this case, for example, you're showing a very clear crests and troughs in your application. So in case you need to plan for any traffic or any extra people on support, it's a little bit more predictability for you. Here is again, I'm going to go back to Netflix analogy multiple times in this talk, but here again um, in the, uh, is, a, is a beautiful blog uh, on Netflix tech blog they essentially talk about this concept of a business metric. And across Netflix, they were looking at it, what is the right business metrics that they can capture, essentially, from the perspective of a user? So they came up with this metric called as SPS. That means it's how many starts per second. Because at the end of the day, Netflix is in the business of customers logging into Netflix.com, starting a video, and watching it. So they came up with this metric called as SPS. Um, and they realized, as I was talking about, uh, their peaks occur in the evening, troughs in the morning. Um, they also learned that on regional holidays when people are, are, are off from work, and that's you know, because Netflix runs in so many countries around the world, their concept of regional holidays is very, very regional. So they need to kind of accommodate for that kind of a traffic. Netflix runs on Amazon, and in Amazon we have this concept of a region which is a, which is a physical location around the world where the data centers are sitting. In that region, we have multiple availability zones. Those availability zones are typically a distance away from each other, and that's sort of how our customers build resilient, distributed, highly available applications. Now, if you read the Netflix case study, they'll talk about how they're running across uh, three availability regions and multiple availability zones to build that architecture and achieve that high availability and resiliency. But if you were to accommodate for regional holidays, peak time traffic, you know, non-peak time traffic, all of those considerations becomes very important. And then you really want to understand the top level pulse so that everybody can go behind that. Because no matter what your service is offering, if the starts, the number of starts per second is not at a healthy level, then something is wrong down the line. I'll give a personal example. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was watching a video all of a sudden, the quality downgraded from HD to non-HD. And then a couple of minutes later, it went back to HD again. 
Now, to me, as a customer, that is an acceptable experience as opposed to I'm watching my How Did You Get Away With Murder series and I'm right in the middle of a climax here and then I get HTTP 503 error. I think that'll be disappointing. I'm okay downgrading the media stream to a little bit lower quality as opposed to bam, there is a HTTP 503 from Tomcat server. And that's very creepy. All right, we talked about steady state. So let's talk about what, what is the concept of a hypothesis. Well, hypothesis is what if. You, know, you always ask in terms of what if. What, what are the things that can potentially go wrong here? Well, um, if you're looking at your application, as we talked about earlier, anything and everything that you can think of can potentially go wrong. What if a service gives 404 or 503? You know, I mean, in a modern application these days, the way you're building, they're microservices oriented. These microservices could be written in multiple languages, written, deployed across multiple availability zones. A typical application could consist of hundreds of microservices. What if a service goes down? What if a latency increases by 300 milliseconds? What if a port is not accessible? What if somebody changed the security group? What if somebody changed uh, my IP tables, you know, or the database stops, or you know, uh, anything could happen? So I mean, there are a lot of possibilities Think about how your application is going to behave if any of these metrics or if any of these hypotheses become true. The key thing about hypothesis is, you know, you are hypothesizing that this will happen and then you try to simulate it. And that's sort of what your design experiment stage is. Because essentially in design experiment you say, here is a hypothesis if my application is going to throw 404. Now, if your application is working, it will never throw 404. But more often than not, it could throw a 404. Or if the, the Tomcat server crashes for some reason in the back end, you know, it could start throwing HTTP 503 and you don't know what's really happening. So you really start designing the experiment. You basically pick an, ex uh, pick an hypothesis that my hypothesis is my application is going to start throwing HTTP 503 error. You scope the experiment that, all right, uh, I am going to design, I'm going to take a data set. There is a control set and then there is a real set you know, which is sort of running in production. So from the production data, from the production users, I'm going to carve out maybe 5% of the users and that's where I'm going to do the experiment. The important part is this is not something you do like in a dev testing stages. This needs to happen in production so that you get a real feel. You know, I mean, if there is no urgency, if you're doing this in a dev test in a lax environment, there is really no urgency to fix it because the moment you know there are business stakes at risk, there is an urgency and then you right away get on to fix it. So uh, you scope the experiment to the, num to the users on who are going to face that experiment and then you identify the metrics that if, my fi if a particular microservice is thro throwing, for example, HTTP 503, here are the metrics that I want to see. That if this throws 503, I'm going to gracefully degrade to a different service or I'm going to lower the quality of service. You identify the metrics and make sure that everybody in the organization is aware of it. Chaos engineering is a lot about communication within the organization itself. So as I said earlier, the goal for you is to really start very small. You know, you don't want to blast that you know, HTTP 503 error to the 100% of your users because that could impact your business right away. Um, and sometimes I understand it may not be possible to do fully in the production environment, but try to mimic it into as close to production environment. And I'll talk about some strategies on how you can do that. Um, as part of the hypothesis, you also want to minimize the blast radius. Um, uh, make sure you pick a hypothesis that is real. Uh, a hypothesis should not be that, oh, my web page is not accessible. Now then that is the right impact right there itself. So kind of Start picking up a smaller experiment, build with that, and then you build confidence, and then you grow your experiment. And at any point of time, you should have a failover plan that, you know, I want to stop the experiment now because it is too critical for me to conduct a business. So I think that's sort of an emergency stop is very important. So uh, one of the strategies essentially is to do a canary deployment. Now, what you could do is, for example, um, of the 100% of the users, you can say, I'm going to introduce this new functionality where I can start experimenting with 
uh, the error that we were talking about, that the service is going to start throwing the HTTP 503 error to only one person of the users. Um, and there are several ways by which you can adapt that functionality, and I'll talk about that in the context of Kubernetes in a few minutes. But the idea is you can do simple Route 53 switching that instead of sending all the traffic to my uh, green deployment, I'm going to um, to my red deployment, and I'll create a green deployment, and then I'm going to switch one person of the traffic to green deployment. And Route 53 has that capability. Well, Route 53 is a naming service uh, from uh, Amazon. Now, we have talked about phases of chaos engineering, you know, the design and experiment part of it. Let's talk about a little bit of the most important part of this is once you have identified what's going on, then the idea is to verify and learn, okay? So what are you going to do? Well, the important part is you figure out how long it's going to take to detect it. And you know, if there is a HTTP 503 error, do you detect it right away? Or are you getting a customer escalation and then you see it? You know, do you have proactive metrics built into the system, uh, alerting system built into your system by which you find it out before your customer do? Think about if the system does go down, do you have the degradation built into it? You know, if there is a time for recovery, you know, partial recovery or full recovery. So there are a lot of aspects that you need to be aware of, particularly when you are trying to put the quantitative aspects of the results uh, that are together. Because this is an experiment I conducted. It took me you know, 30 minutes for the recovery, um, 30 minutes for the identification, and then fi further 15 more minutes for you know, the actual recovery itself, which could be like, you know, maybe I realize, oh, my service was down, and, uh, or the number of user spike was much higher, so I need to make sure I set up my auto scaling group, which will allow me to scale my cluster automatically at a higher threshold. Often, uh, this thing could become that, here is this one person, you know, who did it, and let's put everything on that one person. It's a very important aspect that you want to learn about it that let's not make it personal. This should not be a personal thing. Uh, my, one of my managers at Oracle told me that, Arun, uh, it's always about making it very cold about the issue and warm about the person. Often I've seen it becomes cold about the person, warm about the issue. You know, you want to make sure that the issue is the problem, not the person. As a human being, we all make mistakes. And it's okay to embrace it and then move on with it. As opposed to like blaming that one person. No, you did the problem. Not going to work on my project. I'm out of it. That's the important aspect. It's a very important cultural aspect that we all need to learn as well. Um, one of the <clears throat> concepts that I want to explain here is uh, within Amazon we have is this concept of a correction of errors. Um, and correction of errors is like, you know, uh, if you made a mistake for which a customer impact was there, how do you do a correction of error? How do you fix the process so that it doesn't happen again? And uh, in the correction of errors, it's a very, very explicit and conscious discussion that is not about that person. It's about the process. That somewhere the process fell apart, so let's try to fix it. So the way we do that is uh, we think about five whys. Okay, and let me walk you through this. This is a very peculiar Amazon thing, essentially. So the first thing that happened is, say, for example, um, an outage happened. And so let's say customers were not able to uh, access the website for 45 minutes. That's a big outage, essentially, but that's sort of the outage. So you say, okay, why did the outage happen? Well, the outage happened because there was unprecedented demand from other services. Okay, so services were not able to serve over demand. Let's ask my next why. Well, that happened because my service was dependent on another service that could not handle the demand. So my services were okay, but some other service that I was dependent upon, they were not able to ha handle the demand. Okay, well, why was the service not able to meet the demand? What was their SLA? What was their service level agreement? You know, that would they scale, would they not scale? What was their SLA? So again, another why that goes up there. Well, the SLA was there, but they were not able to, they did not have enough capacity. Like they were in a particular region where the region was getting out of capacity. So, okay, well, that's a good reason, but what we could have done differently? The idea is to keep going back 
and I'll keep peeling the onion until you get to the real aspect, until, the, until you get to the real issue. Um, so yes, there was a dependency on other services. Yes, there was no SLA defined. So you identify a few issues over there, but the key part really is, what if that happens again with another service? So you really still want to define, essentially, a graceful degradation of your service, that in case that thing happens again, there is at least not a HTTP 503, but a nicer error message or some sort of a mechanism that could be communicated back to the user. So the last thing really is about fixing. You know, uh, oftentimes, the most challenging part is to identify the problem. And what is the root cause of the problem? And that's sort of where the cultural issues get in. You know, after you have hopefully not blamed and killed that one person in your life you know, who caused that bug, um, you moved on, and then you are ready to fix that issue here. So essentially, um, after running your first experiment, hopefully uh, there is one of two outcomes. You have either verified that your system is resilient, which is a good thing. That, you know, hey, I tried that experiment, and that experiment worked, and my application responded successfully. Or you realize that in my control set where I did the experiment, the experiment was successful, but the application was not resilient. That HTTP 503 means it percolated up to the client and the client was getting an exception stack trust. That is not acceptable. So then you get to work, basically. Then you know what's going to happen. You know. Then you know how your exception stack trace is populating up the stack, and then you got to just fix it. Okay. This was a quote by, um, this is a beautiful paper written by uh, Richard uh, Cook. You know, it's about um, how complex systems fail. So again, I will share the URL with all of you. But it basically says, failure free, or free operations require experience with failure. The important concept that I'm trying to tell you here is, failure will happen no matter what you say. We just got to embrace it and just got to live with it, okay? Now, let's switch gears. <clears throat> we talk about the theory, we talk about the concepts for all this along. Let's talk about how does a Kubernetes cluster look like. In a Kubernetes cluster, you know, if you're setting up a highly available Kubernetes cluster, um, you want to set up in a region across multiple availability zones. We talked about the concept of region and availability zone earlier. In a Kubernetes cluster, well, what is Kubernetes? Well, Kubernetes is an open source orchestration system, and that is a project under Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So essentially, when you are building a containerized application using Docker, it's fun to start with you know, one or two con Docker containers on your desktop, and they're OK. But when you start to grow your application, you know, the number of Tomcat instances is the number of your Docker containers. You know, the number of caching layers, the number of databases, the number of messaging servers, the number of email servers. Essentially, if all of those are translated into Docker containers, your application has lots and lots of Docker containers. And again, you can run a good amount of those Docker containers on your machine, on your local desktop, or when you go into production, you have hundreds and thousands of Docker containers running across a wide AWS region availability zones. That's where you need something like production. Um, so, of course, Amazon has ECS, or Elastic Container Service, uh, which runs hundreds of millions of containers every week. Or you can use Kubernetes, and we have a managed uh, Kubernetes service, which I'll talk about in a second as well. So go back to Kubernetes again. Now, when you are setting up a Kubernetes cluster, in the Kubernetes cluster, you have this concept of a control plane. The control plane is where you guide to, OK, here is my control plane, which is going to manage my cluster, essentially. And then at the bottom, what you have is a data plane. Data plane is where your EC2 instances are running, and that's exactly where your containers get started here, OK? Now, if I were to split up control plane into two pieces, one is controller, uh, which is basically sort of the API server, which receives a request from the CLI. And the second part is the HCD, which is a distributed watchable registry where the state of the cluster is being stored, OK? Let's take a look at it. What are the concepts that Kubernetes already offers you in terms of resiliency? And I call it as a resiliency as a service from Kubernetes itself. Now, Kubernetes has this concept of pod. It doesn't take dog, uh, containers as a lowest level unit. It really takes pods as a lowest level unit. A pod could have multiple containers. <clears throat> and one of the concepts that Kubernetes has is you make a deployment using a Kubernetes manifest file. And in that Kubernetes manifest file, you specify, in this deployment, I want such and such number of replicas of a pod. 
Now, if you say five pods, Kubernetes will make sure five pods are up and running. If the desired number of pods and the actual number of pods are not matching, Kubernetes will reconcile it for you. So you no longer have to run a monitoring script, you know, things like that, I and mean, it just automatically reconciles it for you. Uh, there are uh, automatic health-based check, checks available. So for example, you could say, when the pod comes up, here is my HTTP URL that you should ping, and if that URL is not responding within 300 milliseconds, that means the pod is not valid or something has gone wrong. So kill that pod and restart it all over again. Or even if the pod is running, make sure you run this health check every three seconds, and if the pod is not healthy, terminate it, and Kubernetes will fire up the pod at somewhere else. When Kubernetes is spreading those pods across your um, region or availability uh, across your region, it will make sure the pods are distributed across availability zones. So it kind of gives you that resiliency automatically. There is nothing that you need to do about it. You say, create a deployment, scale the deployment to five pods, and those five pods are spread across, if there are three availability regions, or availability zones, then two, two, and one, and it'll spread them out accordingly. That's the default Kubernetes algorithm. It also has a concept of, I have a deployment uh, in Kubernetes, and now I want to do a rolling deployment, so, or I want to upgrade my deployment, then it'll do a rolling deployment. That means it'll take a deployment down on one particular availability zones, upgrade those, then second and then third. So at a given point of time, your application is already alive, and always alive. So these are some of the resiliency uh, applications or practices that Kubernetes already employs for you. There is really nothing you need to do for this. So if you are running Kubernetes, you get these benefits out of the box. Let's go back to our clusters. Now, as I talked about, uh, um, Amazon offers Amazon EKS, or Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes, which is a managed control plane for you. Um, so you can go to aws.amazon.com slash EKS to get more details about it. And uh, essentially use the AWS console to fire up an EKS cluster, and then you get a fully managed container, uh, f a fully managed uh, cluster as part of that, or the control plane at least. Now, the control plane, as I said, is managed by AWS. The data plane, which is the worker nodes, are still managed in customer account. So you are responsible for that at this point of time. So if uh, we were to take a simplified positioning of this, essentially, I have my cluster control plane running up there, and then I have my data plane running in my own account. Okay? Let's take a look at what does it offer, what does Amazon EKS offer you in terms of resiliency? Well, we have a highly available control plane. So you just go create an EKS cluster, you get a fully available control plane for you. Uh, it's available in multiple regions across all of those availability zones, so it gives you that availability. The master and the worker nodes are automatically set up in auto-scaling group. What that means is, if a worker goes down, let's say you set up a five worker node data plane, and if a worker node goes down, because of the auto-scaling group, it'll restart that particular worker, so that kind of gets it going for you as well. Um, if you look at Kubernetes documentation, it talks about the instance type of the master needs to match based upon the number of pods in your cluster. And the instance type needs to auto-scale if the number of pods grow up. Well, if you're running your own Kubernetes cluster, you go to manage that upgrade by yourself. But in case of EKS, Amazon takes care of it for you automatically. So again, a resiliency that is given to you. And etcd, which is the most critical piece, I would say, from um, the stateful perspective of Kubernetes, uh, is highly available and backed up every hour for you. So in case your cluster does go down for some reason, you can restore it very easily. So again, these are some of the capabilities um, from resiliency perspective that Amazon EKS offers to you. Now, let's take a look at it. What, where are the places where chaos can potentially happen in a Kubernetes cluster? My connection from the worker node to the control plane can go down for some reason. That can happen. You know, somebody could just pull the network plug, as a matter of fact. Uh, my health check on the node, uh, because ultimately it's an EC2 instance. For some reason, that EC2 instance could become loaded, um, or the EC, the, it's an operating system, something could cause a glitch, it can go down. My entire availability zone can go down. So what I'm trying to show you here is, you know, 
independent of you know how resilient your applications is, there are still things that can go wrong, and those are the things that you need to practice you know in your real life for making sure your applications continue to stay resilient. So let's talk about some of the tools that we have seen customers using, particularly for doing chaos engineering with Kubernetes. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, I'll talk about Service Mesh Istio particularly. Um, I'll also talk about Chaos Toolkit, which is an open source uh, toolkit for causing chaos engineering. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about KubeMonkey, and then there are other tools as well that you can take a look at it and see how they are applicable to Kubernetes or to a broader set of technologies. So what is Istio? Well, Istio is a service mesh. Um, and if you've not heard of the concept of a service mesh, essentially think about it. If you're deploying your containerized application, if you're deploying your microservices-based application, you know, so let's say you're using Spring Boot um, as your um, entry point. Now, Spring Boot is written in Java. You want to achieve high availability. You know, there are lots of cross-cutting concerns in that application. Um, how do I achieve high availability? How do I achieve circuit breaker? How do I achieve timeouts? How do I make sure I retry if an application fails? Uh, how do I do canary deployment? Now, if you're doing Spring Boot, then there are frameworks available in Spring Boot and associated applications that can allow you to do that. But if you're building a microservices-based application, you have the flexibility to choose multiple languages. So how do you adapt that? You know, that really causes a framework explosion, essentially. And what I mean by that is, if you're doing only Spring Boot, then you can use the Spring Boot libraries. But if you're doing Node or Ruby and Rails or Groovy and Grails or whatever your favorite framework is, you need to understand all of those different frameworks and use their framework specific libraries. So it really kind of starts your head to explode because essentially you're addressing the same concern again and again. And so that's exactly where Istio really helps out. And the way Istio does it is, you know, it has this concept of a sidecar. Now remember we talked about pod. Pod has the concept of one container in it, but it can have multiple containers. So what you're doing is essentially you're taking a pod, your application container is in it. In addition, you are injecting another container in it that called a sidecar container. And that sidecar container in case of Istio is Envoy. So Envoy is a proxy that was built by Lyft. And with that proxy, they are able to essentially do 2 million concurrent users in, in per second. So that it's known to scale really well. And the way this works in the Kubernetes land essentially is you have your pod. Each pod has an Envoy proxy. It's a very lightweight footprint written in C++, so very highly efficient. But once the proxy is injected, the containers within the pod, if they want to talk to a containers in a different pod, they don't talk to each other. The containers will talk to the Envoy proxy. The Envoy proxy will then talk to another Envoy proxy in whichever pod they want to talk to. So the, the containers can talk to, within, to each other in the pod, but any traffic that is happening across pods is going through the Envoy proxy. So imagine if your app consists of 100 containers, so you have 100 Envoy proxies really talking to each other. So you need something to manage that set of Envoy proxies that is floating around. And that's essentially what your Istio is. Istio is the control plane for your data plane of Envoy proxies, okay? And that's the whole concept of a service mesh. Because the entire traffic is being routed through Envoy, it gives you a lot of flexibility. It gives you all these abilities by which you can do traffic routing, you can do traffic shifting, you can do canary deployments, all of that. It is very resilient across uh, languages and platforms. Your application can continue to focus on your core competency, which is business logic. Um, but all of those cross-cutting concerns we talked about can be done at the Istio level now. Uh, you can, uh, it also gives you a lot of telemetry data, which is very important for you to understand. So let's start getting more real about it. Now, with Istio, you get a lot of resiliency as well. Now, Istio is just one service mesh. There are other service meshes like Linkerd that you can take a look at it as well. Um, with Istio, what you can do is you can easily introduce timeouts in your application. That my, um, independent of the language or the framework that I'm using, I want to introduce a timeout in my application. And I'll talk about how do you do that. I'll give you the syntax for it. 
uh, you can start setting up concurrent connection limit and the request load that how many concurrent users am I going to expect? So start setting your limits. Or if you want to simulate a spike in traffic, you can start simulating simulate that many concurrent users, essentially. You can have uh, active and passive health checks in your application as well, and that works very well. You can start doing automatic failovers that in case my service goes down, it's giving a particular error, failover to a different service. So all those concepts are available to you within Istio. So what I'm going to talk about particularly today is two aspects. Uh, one is uh, the concept of a delay, that how you can easily inject delay in your application. And then the other concept I'll talk about is how you can cause an application to crash. Now, doesn't mean your application is crashing, but because the Envoy is the one that is doing all the network simulation, you know, you can cause that simulation to happen at the Envoy level itself. Okay? What's a technical keynote without any code samples? So let's take a look at our YAML file here. So what I'm showing here is essentially um, a DSL you know, that Istio introduced. This is basically nothing but a Kubernetes manifest. And in this uh, DSL, what I'm showing you here is how I can define a virtual service. So for example, in this case, I'm defining a virtual service. Well, first of all, on the very top, what I'm showing you is, is a, a V1 Alpha 3 version of the Istio API. Okay? Then I'm talking about, in this API, I have a virtual service and a destination rule. Now these are Istio objects that I'm trying to create here. In the virtual service, I'm trying to define a host. Host could be my Kubernetes service, could be a DNS server, or whatever it wants to be, but I'm just using a simplified version. And I'm saying this greeting is my Kubernetes service, essentially. Within the host, I'm defining sort of what my routes are going to be. And uh, I'm saying I just have one route. So let's say, imagine I have a greeting service running somewhere. And I'm saying my route is going to be greeting hello. And that route is basically is a set of destinations, which are then defined in the destination rule object. And um, as you can see on this case, on the right side, I'm defining my greeting hello is nothing but basically boiling down to my name value pairs that are the labels on the pod. Now, once I have identified, once I have configured that this host and this service and this pod are connected, now is the time to inject some failure. And this is the failure that I'm trying to inject here. All I'm saying is that 100% of the services inject a delay of 10 seconds. Now, think about this, how difficult or how challenging it is to introduce this in your application. But here, just create these two objects, and it will simulate on how this delay can be done. I'm saying 100% of the services, but I can, again, if I were to limit my control set, I can say instead of 100% of the services, do this only for 10% of the services. So that number is very easily configurable for you. If I were to do a fault injection for HTTP abort, you know, I just introduce a 10 second delay for my service. Now, I will, all I want to do is, I want the services to start returning a HTTP 500 error and see you know, what services are going to, how the other services are going to react or respond to it. So once again, I'm doing 100% of the services returning a HTTP 500 error. You could do whatever HTTP error code you want to return. And again, constrain your control group to either 100% or ideally to a much smaller group to keep your blast radius small. Another very important concept that the service mesh or Istio provides you is the concept of a traffic management. Okay, so let's take a look at it this now. Now, in this case, um, I have in my virtual service, I have two destinations. Okay, I had the service called as greeting hello. Now, let's say I have two services greeting hello that returns hello, and then there's a greeting howdy that returns a howdy message. So, two services. Okay. Um, all I'm saying is, in my virtual service, I have two destinations. Both of those services are pointing to greeting hello and greeting howdy. Those are my two destinations. And I'm just assigning weight. That means 75% of the traffic goes to greeting hello, and 25% of the traffic goes to greeting howdy. So it's a very simplified way by which you can specify how do you want to split your traffic. This is also called as traffic shifting uh, in terms of Istio language. 
This is very easy to incorporate in our canary deployment, for example. So imagine you are greeting hello and greeting howdy services are running, and you deploy this one object, and you just set the greeting howdy to 10%, and then 10% of the traffic will be start sending to greeting howdy. And then you can have your health check best start, starts, restarts in the pod itself to make sure that you are all your business metric. Remember, we had the concept of SPS in terms of Netflix. Define your own business metric and figure out how that would be relevant from doing this canary deployment. There is also the concept of a circuit breaker within Istio itself. So if you look at it here, for example, in this case, I'm saying I have a traffic policy that the maximum connections that will be allowed is 100. So that's the one that I want to set for. Um, so if you have set the maximum connections to 100, then you want to make sure that you understand how your users are getting reacted or what kind of response they're going to start getting as well. So I would highly recommend going to istio.com, uh, istio.io actually, slash docs. And there's a really good documentation around how do you get started with Istio. Um, particularly, um, last week we introduced the feature by which it allows you to set up Istio very seamlessly on EKS. And uh, my team actually wrote a blog on that. So take a look at that. The second tool that I want to talk about is um, uh, Chaos Toolkit. Now, Chaos Toolkit is an open API for chaos engineering, essentially. Um, and the way this flow works like, you know, you, it's basically you as a developer, that's me. Uh, there's, I will use Chaos Toolkit. The Chaos Toolkit will act on my system, which is basically my application. And then I have a bunch of drivers which basically drive what's going to happen to the application, essentially. And the, it has drivers for a lot of cloud providers and a lot of frameworks. But the thing that matters to us in this case is it has a driver for AWS, and it has a driver for Kubernetes. So in that sense, it gives you the ability to act at the AWS level itself. So for example, if you want to simulate a region going down, or if you want to simulate an IAM role having revoked with a certain privilege, or simulate a hole in your security group, or break a hole in your security group, all those capabilities you can essentially experiment at the AWS layer itself. So um, the Chaos Toolkit, essentially, um, the way it works is, is CLI driven. You have a CLI by which you can simulate those experiments. Uh, the experiments by themselves are declared in a JSON or a YAML file, and I'll show you those experiments essentially. And it's very extensible, as I said. Um, depending upon what level you are operating at, not just Kubernetes, not just AWS, but Spring, for example, you can start simulating at Spring application level itself. And I think and that's what makes um, Chaos Toolkit that much more attractive. The Chaos Toolkit literally follows the principles of chaos. Um, it basically says you define your experiments, uh, you run those experiments, and you get the results, and that's where it stops, because the fixing is essentially the responsibility of the application developer who's conducting those experiments. So that's sort of the way you work with it, okay? So how does uh, Chaos Toolkit um, work? Uh, it has the constructs called as probes. Uh, probes are the ones um, that basically query a system to observe a behavior. The behavior could be use these labels to query a certain set of pods and return the response back to me in less than 300 milliseconds. And I should get a response that looks like you know, a web, web page. That's your response. That's your query, essentially. That's your probe, essentially. Uh, and then, of course, there are methods, uh, which basically are real-world events. In the sense, uh, a file system crash, a network failure, terminating the pod, those are your real-world events. And then eventually, uh, you have types of probes and method. You know, it could be a process, uh, which is basically run a binary somewhere from the network, um, or it could be invoking a HTTP endpoint. More commonly, it's a Python function. Chaos Toolkit is written in Python by Russ Miles and the guys behind tool Toolkit. Um, uh, it's a Python function that can execute on your behalf in the Kubernetes cluster itself. So let's take a look at it. I'm showing you a JSON YAML file for how the Chaos Toolkit would look like. Uh, essentially, what I have is the metadata about it. And the key part that I want to highlight here is in the metadata itself, I'm defining an environment variable saying, oh, web app URL. Uh, this could change based upon my test dev staging production environments. 
and when you invoke chaos toolkit experiment, read that environment variable. Now, in this case, I'm defining sort of what my steady state and hypothesis is. Um, and if I were to walk you through this, on the left, basically what I'm showing you is a probe. Um, to the probe, I have a name called as alive and healthy. And I'm saying the provider, you know, that means what the probe is going to look like is basically a Python function in a particular module. And I have a function name called as pods in phase. So that's the function essentially that I'm going to run here. And to that function, I have certain arguments. Uh, the arguments are basically, what is my label selector? That use these labels to select the pod, um, and what is the namespace? So you can really get down very narrow in the Kubernetes landscape, particularly using uh, Chaos Toolkit. And then I have a subsequent probe where I'm saying, okay, the application must respond normally. Uh, and in this case, I'm saying the timeout is defined to be three seconds using the web app URL that we talked about earlier. Um, now, once you have identified what your probes are going to look like, then you start getting into you know, what my actions are going to be. In this case, I'm saying terminate my greeting service. So think about I have a greeting service, a name service, and a web app. And web app is the one that your client is invoking, which then talks to name and greeting and get the response back. If I were to terminate the greeting service, what the response would be. So um, in this case, all I'm doing is I'm just dumping the logs out and let the user figure it out. But because it's a Python function and very extensible, so you can start getting, you know, doing more interesting things with Chaos Toolkit because of the extensibility and the open source nature for it. So this is exactly how my logs are going to look like. Um, you can see all the statements are info. And then in between, I have a critical one which says um, steady state probe application must respond normally is not in the given tolerance and failing this experiment. So that's essentially the part that is very relevant to you, that application, the hypothesis was great, the, application, the experiment succeeded because the application failed, now is the time to go fix it. That what is it that caused the problem and you're going to start debugging your code and fix it. So you're basically fixing it hopefully before it goes into production and it doesn't happen in production. So once again, uh, Chaos Toolkit is completely open source, so go to this uh, GitHub URL and learn more about it. They're always looking for contributors. So my recommendation is to go contribute over there as well. Um, another last tool that I want to talk about here is the concept of KubeMonkey. Um, this is basically an uh, implementation of Netflix's uh, Chaos Monkey. Um, and it's a very simplified implementation of uh, Chaos Monkey, essentially. Um, all it does is you, know, you define a schedule. And within that schedule, it will randomly start deleting pods. And you can st um, set up thresholds that don't delete pods uh, beyond a certain number of time or beyond a certain percentage. Okay? Uh, once again, I want to show quick code here. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm running a cube monkey. I'm creating the configuration here. I'm defining that the run hours and the start hour and the end hour, defining my namespaces, whitelisted namespaces. So kind of narrowing down my control set as we talked about in the principles of chaos. And then finally, I'm saying uh, the important part to understand is this is an opt-in, that you need your application to explicitly opt in to KubeMonkey. By default, it will not be enabled. You know, there's no new resource that you need to create here. So in the Kubernetes deployment itself, you're saying, OK, KubeMonkey enabled, add the an annotation over there, and then everything starts kicking in for you. So for example, in this case, I'm saying um, the mean time, well, um, the mean time between failure is two, sec uh, two seconds, actually, um, and I want to kill maximum of 40% of my pods. So maximum 40% 40, 40 of your pods will be randomly killed between the hours that we specified for KubeMonkey. Okay? So um, talk a little bit about their website. So go to this, and this is where all the details are available. The last thing, one of the last things that I want to talk about here is uh, if you are part of Cloud Native Computing Foundation, uh, there is a chaos engineering working group over there. I've been part of that working group from the very beginning. That working group is trying to come up with a white paper which defines what chaos engineering is, what those chaos engineering principles are going to look like. So if something like chaos engineering matters to you, I would highly recommend joining that working group and start participating in there, start submitting pull requests over there. So I'm going to just wrap up with this particular slide here and one more after this, which is basically a chaos engineering mind map. It talks about you know, the peoples, the processes, the tools around chaos engineering 
So if this is an area of interest to you or to your customers, of course, come talk to us. Um, I work for Amazon. Or take a look at this. See what are the areas that make sense to you. My last quote for the day essentially is, when you are running your systems in production, the moment you don't choose the moment that if thing, when things are going to fail, the moment chooses you. Um, so you want to be ready when the moment chooses you. And that's the reason you're doing really chaos engineering. And this was made by Mike Birch, uh, who was the fire chief in the Palo Alto department. And my, I, I work out of Palo Alto office. So it really makes sense that, you know, how do you connect with chaos engineering? And this is sort of one code that I really connect with. Thank you. And I think I'm out of the time. Uh, I'm going to be standing outside. If you have any questions, I would love to talk to you. Thanks.